Thank you. Um, I will be presenting a joint recent work with Eike and Federico. And I will be talking about generic group lower bounds and sort of the motivation why we looked at those concrete problems stems from investigating the scaling behavior of public key encryption. So I will be talking a bit about this as well. So a short overview on what I want to talk about. So since it is a rather unusual security notion, I will start with an introduction to multi-instance security and then talk a bit about scaling. Then I will briefly discuss our main results on the scaling behavior of hashtag gamma key encapsulation. And then I want to spend most of the time of this talk on uh, talking about our new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of computing, like multiple instances of development type problems, which are sort of at core uh, on our insights in, in the scaling behavior. Good, let's start with uh, multi-instance security. So usually when we define the security of cryptographic schemes, we require that it should not be feasible to break the security of even a single user. And sometimes we even look at more general, stronger notions of security like multi-user security where you would have a set of users and now we still require that it should not be possible to compromise a single user. Now in this talk, I will uh, use a different notion of security. So what we have here is multi-instance security, where we actually only consider an adversary, uh, or only consider the break of the scheme if the adversary is actually able to compromise the security of all users. And what we are interested in is sort of the relation between the hardness of breaking n instances of the scheme compared to breaking a single instance. So we could illustrate this like this. So on the x-axis, we have the number of compromised users. And here on the y-axis, I have the computational effort. So you can just think of the running time. And as you can see, so attacking one instance of my scheme takes time t. And now there could be different scenarios. So in the best case, you would imagine that the only way to attack several instances of the scheme is to basically rerun the full single instance attack. So in this case, the behavior would scale linear in the number of users. However, it could also be worse. It could be that already an attack on, on one instance of the scheme would give you some information which now enables you to break like more and more instances of the scheme very efficiently. And sort of the question we ask in this work is what is the actual behavior? So this probably at first glance sounds a bit obscure because in theory, of course, we choose the parameters of our scheme such that it should not even be possible to break a single instance of the scheme. And this, of course, in particular, excludes attacks on, on several instances. However, in practice, actually, it's quite widespread that users rely on outdated parameters. And now in that case, it could be possible that if we consider adversaries which have access to substantial resources might be able to break like single instances of the scheme. And now this scaling behavior can make a huge difference. So if the scaling behavior is good, then still we have like a mounting cost of computational computational effort needed to, to break like, the scheme. On the other hand, if the scaling behavior is bad, this uh, could translate into a large scale attack where an attacker is able to break lots of in uh, instances in basically the same time as one. And this has been in fact exploited in, uh, in the famous logjam attack of Adrian et al. So there the authors were able to uh, perform a man in the middle attack um, on TLS instantiated over finite field subgroups of bit length 512. And so it's a pre-processing attack. So after performing some, some substantial pre-processing, they were able to attack every instance with, with very low effort. So here, uh, essentially, attacking 1 million instances of the scheme in this parameter range is just twice the cost of breaking one instance. So to make sure I yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess you could see it as a, as a subcase. So we focused on, on public key crypto here, yeah. But you have hmm? relation between the instances, right? So uh, no, so, so the, the example we will look at is actually like multiple D-log instances over the same group. So the correlation is that it's in a single group. So there you can do more efficient things. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, we kind of focus on particular problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sort of what we are, um, try is to, to quantify the scaling behavior, and then quite intuitively, I think we, so what we look at is, so this is kind of hand wavy, uh, is this scaling factor of the scheme, which is the fastest time, uh, the fraction of the fastest time to break n instances of the scheme compared to the fastest time of breaking one instance of the scheme. And in this talk, I will only focus on adversaries which achieve overwhelming success probability, but we cover like more general settings in, in the paper. And so the question is, is it possible to derive lower bounds on the scaling factor? And now we sort of take a hard turn towards those specific problems. So we consider hashed algamal in idealized models. So we rely on the random oracle model and also the generic group model. And see, yes, in this case, it is possible to do so. And we, um, as you can see, this is sort of our main result on the scaling behavior. Um, there are two cases. So if you consider hashed algamal in the, how it's usually instantiated in practice, so if you, every user works with the same group, for example, a standardized elliptic curve, then you see that the scaling behavior is not optimal, but actually scales with a square root of n. But on the other hand, if all users would have their own group, so we model those as independent generic groups, so it's probably not too surprising, you actually get an optimal scaling behavior. So our approach, so the upper bound, there's actually not much to do, and I guess I'm not supposed to talk about it anyway. So there are known generic algorithms which are able to solve multiple instances of D log over a fixed group with a speed up of square root in the number of instances, which essentially gives you this upper bound. So the more interesting part is this lower bound. So if we want to lower bound this quantity, we have to upper bound the denominator. For this, we can just look at um, uh, the fastest, uh, any, any attack we know. So for example, we know that it's possible to compute in a group of prime order p, one d log in time square root of p. So the main sort of technical contribution in this work is that we give new generic group bounds on the minimal time required to uh, break several instances, and there we differentiate between this fixed group and individual group setting. So a rough approach, uh, so roughly how we approach this is we work our way up so um, um, I didn't really tell you what it actually means for a CAM or for PKE to be this multi-instance secure. So we rely on a security notion by Bellari, Ristenpart, and uh, Stefano. I do not want to go into detail about this because I want to focus on the generic groups, uh, bounds. And then in the first step, we show in the random oracle model that the hardness of this multi-instance security notion is actually tightly implied by a multi-instance version of the gap computational Diffie-Hellman problem. So the problem where you have to solve n instances of CDH while giving access to a decisional Diffie-Hellman oracle. Then in a second step, we show that every generic group lower bound for the gap multi-instance discrete logarithm problem actually carries over to the multi-instance gap CDH problem. So there we rely on the algebraic group model by uh, Fuchsbauer, Kills, and Loss. And then sort of in a final step, we actually derive new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of this multi-instance gap discrete lower rhythm problem. Okay, so as you can see, so at core of, of, of our results are those new generic group lower bounds, and I want to spend now the rest of the talk to give you a bit more details on that. 20. 20. Oh, okay, then there's plenty of time. Okay, so what is known on, on the hardness of uh, multi-instance discrete logarithm in generic groups? So there's a beautiful paper by Aran Yoon, who established a lower bound on the hardness of uh, yeah, solving n discrete logarithms in a fixed group of prime order p. So the approach taken there is to connect this problem to a geometric search problem and then prove informa information theoretic lower bound on the hardness of this search problem. Now in this work, as you have seen, um, we derive first a bound on gap D log and then on gap CDH. And as you can see, 
all of those uh, problems essentially behave the same. And then we also consider this second setting where we consider independent generic groups where you can see that the hardness is actually scales better. And finally, we're actually able to get a bit more general result than this multi-instance gapd log. So gapd log gives you a DDH oracle, which means on input G to the A, G to the B, G to the C, you, this oracle tells you whether A times B is C modulo P. Now in this, this new problem, which we call the polycheck discrete global problem of degree D, we actually allow the adversary to check for arbitrary polynomials up to degree D, which is this additional parameter. And as you can see, um, then our bound actually decreases in D. And um, this problem, so for, for all of those problems, we actually know that those bounds are optimal, so they exist corresponding algorithms. With this one, I do not know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, oh yeah, this we also consider, but this doesn't give you anything. No, it's really n independent generic groups. Yeah. Good. So now I want to um, go a bit more into detail about how we approach this gap delog problem, which we also connect to a geometric search problem, because I think it is quite quite interesting. Yeah. No, no, it grows as you would expect. No. No. Where everything is completely independent, I, I couldn't think of of an example. No. So if, if, if everything is completely independent, I, I couldn't think of an example where, where this doesn't happen yet. Mm -hmm. So what is not independent is the group, right? So in the same group, yeah. Right, we have this speed up of square root of n. Okay, so let's have a bit more detailed look at this uh, gap delog bound. So, first, a uh, short, okay, the multi instance delog problem, as you could imagine. Now we consider a fixed group, so we would sample n group elements uniformly at random. Then the adversary on input of those group elements has to output the discrete logarithm of all of those group elements. <coughs> So in the gap setting, we additionally give the adversary access to this decisional Diffie-Hellman oracle. That is, it can query g to the a, g to the b, g to the c, and then the oracle is going to tell um, the adversary whether this uh, triple of, of group elements actually defines a uh, Diffie-Hellman tuple with respect to this uh, group generator g. And as I said, we consider this in the generic group model. So we restrict our view to algorithms which only rely on the group structure, but do not exploit anything being like, like concrete instantiation of the group. And this is typically modeled by not giving the adversary direct access to the group. Instead, it only gets those opaque handles. And also it gets access to the group operation only via an additional oracle. So if it wants to compute the product of GI and uh, GJ, it would have to query for the corresponding labels, and then the answer would be the label of the product of the corresponding group elements. And of course, also the decisional Diffie-Hellman oracle will be defined with respect to those labels. Okay, so as I said, we want to connect this to a geometric search problem, and what we rely on there is a kind of standard trick with generic groups, that is that all the group elements that the adversary knows 
uh, actually correspond to affine functions in those challenge exponents. So I will run you, if you haven't seen it, through a quick example. So it could be that the adversary in this first query queries for twice the same label, so L1. This means it wants to know what g to the x1 times g to the x1 is, which is g to the 2x1. Then maybe in the second query, it would want to multiply this with a group generator. So in this case, we get an exponent of 2 to the x1 plus 1. And then maybe it adds another group element, x to the 3. So in this case, we end up with 2x1 plus x3 plus 1. And sort of what I want to emphasize, this is an affine function. And since we assume that the adversary does not obliviously sample um, labels, this holds in general. So every group element or the adversary knows will actually correspond to some affine function in those challenge group elements, uh, in those challenge exponents. And the approach we now take is we reconsider the question, assume we do not know x, what questions do we have to answer to still be able to consistently simulate both the group uh, operation oracle and the gap oracle. So if we want to simulate group operations for, for example, Li and Lj, then what we have to find out is whether the label corresponding to this group element is already defined. This means we have to check whether there is some k corresponding to some already existing label such that Lk of x equals the sum of those Li and Lj. And now if you look at this, this is actually an affine equation over Zp to the n, so this defines a hyperplane in this space set p to the n. So this is essentially the question, is x an element of this hyperplane defined by this affine function? Now if we consider the gap oracle, it's kind of similar. So we want to check whether xk equals xi times xj. So we can translate those in those affine functions. And now what we end up with is actually a multivariate polynomial of degree two. So this sort of pushes, on, uh, pushes us beyond uh, linear algebra, so now we actually have to consider algebraic geometry. And we know that um, such a, uh, an algebraic, uh, sorry, such a multivariate polynomial defines a hypersurface that is exactly an algebraic set which is generated by a, simple poly, uh, by a single polynomial in Zp to the n. And sort of to answer gap or queries, what we have to answer is, is x an element of this hypersurface? So what we see is that this gap multi-instance D-log problem actually corresponds to a geometric problem, which we call the search by hypersurface queries problem of degree two, because all the polynomials we considered there were of degree at most two. So in the paper, we generalize this to degree D, and then you end up with this polycheck D-log I talked about. So this could be visualized like this. So in this problem, we consider the space at p to the n, and we sample a random point in this space. So for those pictures, I will always use dimension two, and also I will plot those hypersurfaces over the reals, because otherwise it's, it's a bit hard to see something. So the adversary gets no input, but is allowed to perform those hypersurface queries. That is, it can specify arbitrary hypersurfaces of degree, in this case, up to, uh, up to two. And then it, as answer, it's going to re, uh, receive whether the point x it is looking for actually lies on this hypersurface or not. And so in this example with the parabola, x lies on this parabola, so the answer would be yes. Then maybe the adversary would query for this hyperplane. The answer is no. There's another no. Now he is lucky again. So now the adversary would know that actually this point x it's looking for lies in the intersection of those two algebraic sets, which is just a collection of points. Oh, okay, I can actually slow down. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is just a collection of points. And now the adversary could actually proceed by trying to pick out like particular points or simply guess x. Good, so this is this search by hypersurface uh, problem. And what, what we obtain is that from every adversary against the generic group problem we are actually interested in, which is the multi-instance gap D-log problem, we are able to build an adversary against this search by hyperplane problem, having the same advantage. And as you can see, we have a quadratic blow-up in the number of queries. And this stems from the fact that when we simulate the group operation oracle, we have to check against all already defined labels, right? 
And now this allows us to simply focus on this geometric search problem and to find an information theoretic lower bound for it. So this is what we are able to obtain. Every adversary which makes at most Q queries um, has an advantage which is essentially bounded. So I dropped some constants in, in the brackets, which are rather small, by Q over NP to the N. So you can see that the advantage actually decays exponentially in N. And also you could interpret this as that the best way or the only way the adversary an adversary has to be successful in this problem is actually by doing a brute force search in each coordinate, right? It could spend P hyperplane queries to single out each single coordinate and then would uh, yeah, find the point. So how do we prove uh, this bound? Um, so an adversary playing this, this hyperservice uh, game, the only input it gets is the stream of bits, which are the answers to its hypersurface queries, right? And what we want to do now is to show that actually we can restrict our view to a smaller class of adversaries for which at most n of their queries are actually answered with a one. And to do so, what we are going to show is that actually already n hypersurface queries that return one determine the point x up to some okayish probability. And this means we can restrict our view to those adversaries and then if we fix the randomness of an adversary, we can actually compute uh, an upper bound on the number of streams, of bit streams of, of length Q, which have at most N ones. So this was already done by Yoon. And we see that actually the fraction of those uh, input streams is comparatively small compared to the number of points in this space we are looking at. So the main step is to show that actually without loss of generality, we may assume that there's at most n queries which return one. And for this, we give a reduction, which takes a, uh, transforms any uh, arbitrary adversary into an adversary making at most n queries. And so the idea behind this reduction is that it will always keep track of some algebraic set of which it knows that the point x, which it is looking for, is contained in. So if there was no successful query yet, then this set will actually be, of course, the full space. Then maybe at some point, the adversary will find the first, uh, will make its first successful query. So now we see that the point lies on this parabola, which is an algebraic set of dimension one. And then maybe uh, at some point it, it has a second successful probability, and then the reduction knows that x is a point in this intersection, which is, so a collection of point is an algebraic set of dimension zero. So as you have seen, I've, I've been emphasizing the dimension of the set. So the intuition is that for each, sorry, at, at each dimension of this algebraic set, we consider we want to spend at most one query, which returns one. And the problem we run into here with algebraic geometry is that if you intersect algebraic sets, they not necessarily um, give you a single um, irreducible algebraic set, but instead the intersection can split into those irre so-called irreducible components, which in this case are just the points. And those are themselves algebraic sets, so those could be picked out by the adversary the reduction is interacting with by additional hypersurface queries, and then the reduction, of course, wouldn't know how to answer. So our approach is to show that at every step when we go down one dimension, we are actually able to guess the right connected component with sufficiently good probability. And I will visualize this, I, uh, visualize this uh, like this. So uh, we started with an irreducible component of dimension two, then went down to a single irreducible component of dimension one, and then we have seen that it actually splits into those multiple irreducible components. So here the picture is kind of easy, but in general, if we go to higher dimensions, this could look quite complicated. And sort of the goal of our reduction is to guess the correct path through this graph. And the first approach would probably be to simply guess uniformly at random at each step, but actually we do not really know to make, how to make this work. So we have to do a bit uh, 
So we have to rely on a bit stronger results. And actually what we use is the classical result from commutative algebra, which is Bezu's theorem, which essentially tells you the worse our probability of making the correct uh, guess up here, the less potential the, the graph down here has to split. So it connects sort of the degree of those uh, irreducible components to the potential to split into several irreducible components. So our choice will be weighted with the degree of those irreducible components, and then we are able to show that we get a nice uh, like telescopic product of, of conditional probabilities, which just collapses to uh, two to the minus n. And this, at first glance, looks quite bad, but actually, since the advantage we want to, uh, or the bound on our advantage will also be um, De decrease exponentially in n, this doesn't really hurt us, and then we can use our bound on this search by hypersurface problem and get a bound on the gap delog problem, and then using this algebraic group model, we transfer it to the problem we are actually interested in, which is gap CDH, and this is actually a quite, so the, the intuition behind this proof is quite easy, but it turns out to be quite technical. And then overall, we get a bound of roughly q squared over np to the n. So if you want this to be constant, or then you see that the minimal time, uh, which is the number of, of group operation grades, has actually to be squared of n times p. Mm -hmm. OK, so let me sum up. So what you have seen is we derive several new generic group lower bounds um, in, the gener yeah, in the generic group model, and we consider there's two different settings, either with independent, uh, freshly sampled generic groups or with a fixed group. And you can see that then the behavior of, of our bounds is actually different. Maybe to so open problems, yeah. I think in general, it's quite interesting to look at the scaling behavior of, of other cryptographic, cryptographically, cryptographically relevant problems. Here are two which are more in the style of those generic group bounds. So we have this, uh, bound on multi-instance gap delog, which gives us also a bound in the generic bilinear group model. So there it might be interesting to close some gaps for, for certain kernel assumptions. There's, for example, kernel linear, where the best known attack up to my knowledge would be to compute multiple delogs, while the best lower bound we have is, is actually that of one delog. And another problem would be to actually consider those bounds with pre-processing. So the most interesting there would be probably this bound as it heavily relies on this algebraic group model. So I think for all the other bounds, you can uh, just apply the techniques talked about yesterday by Xiao. So, but for this one, it would be actually interesting to yeah, make the algebraic group model applicable to pre-processing. Yeah. Thank you.